But I, I, I got stuck in that question that Josh asked me. He asked me, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Because at the end of the day, everybody has desires. And that's what I want to start with today. I want to start by asking the same question that Josh asked me. He said, what do you want to do? Every single person has desires. Desires are a part of life. Dreaming is a part of life. Especially when you're young, it's like we're in the, in the next gen takeover. And when you're young, it's like the perfect ground and the perfect soil for dreams to actually sprout, for dreams to actually begin. Because when you're young, you get to a point where you're, you're smart enough to weave your dreams into reality, but you're not smart enough to grasp the weight of their cost and let that destroy it, right? You, when, you, when you're young, you get to a point where you're no longer dreaming about being a mermaid or buying a unicorn, right? Like, it's just, you, you can't do it. We get to it. We, we get to a point where we, we make that transition. Like, when you're young, you don't understand enough things to dream a real dream. I have a brother, and he's asked me not to tell this, but... He's not here. So, so I, have, I have a brother, and, and, and this is a true story. And please, like, I hope I, this doesn't offend you, like, right off the gate because I just started. But it's a true story, right? I'm just being real with you. I have a brother, and he used to have a dream. And his dream was when I grow up, I want to be tall, buff, bald, and black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so I, and, I, and I say this story because I think it's awesome how he just really admired the black culture. He wanted to be black. He desired to be black. Well, he wasn't smart enough to weave that into reality. <laughs> like, now, I, I really don't think that could have happened. No matter how much sun, like, he just was not going to get there. But that was his dream. Then you grow up and you learn to weave your dreams into reality, and now you start dreaming things that might actually be possible. But you're not smart enough to understand the cost that it's going to take so you don't let that crush your dreams. But we all have dreams. You grew up with dreams. You grew up with desires. You grew up with wants. Physical, spiritual, emotional. And, and, and when you have desires, you will encounter the two biggest dilemmas that every desire has. Contradiction and complication. Every single dream has contradiction and complication. And this is such a real thing. Ask me how real is it? This is such a real thing. Real enough that it hurts. <laughs> Real enough that it hurts. Every single desire has contradictions and complications. The dilemma of contradiction when it comes to desire is when you have another desire that goes directly against that one desire. Right? Let me explain. It's like when you, when you, when you get to January and you're like, I want abs. Everybody in January wants abs. Like, I want abs. But the dilemma of contradiction with the desire of wanting abs is that you also want ice cream. And unless you're down with some keto ice cream stuff, you might not be, those two desires might not combine, right? The dilemma of contradiction when it comes to desires is I, I want to read. I want to be a reader. But I also want to be a binger. Like I want to read, but I love Netflix and I love Hulu. And, and it's like those two desires sometimes go against each other. And no, even if that show was created off of a novel, you're not technically reading a novel. That's the dilemma of contradiction. The dilemma of contradiction when it comes to desires in the church world and in the spiritual world is uh, I want purity for, for youth in the next-gen takeover, but I also want, want to have sex. It's, it's, it's saying I want sobriety, but I also have this other desire in me that wants to drink and it wants to do drugs. And those two desires contradict each other, and that becomes a dilemma inside of you. Because you want two things that are opposite from each other. And that often happens with desires. The second dilemma that happens with desires is the dilemma of complication. We, 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 we want things, but there are things that are in our way, right? Like, we would love to go to the concert, but we don't have the money right now. Like, we would love to, 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 to go out and, 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 and do vacation, but we just, we just can't right now. Right? It's a dilemma of complication when it comes to desires. I want friends, but I, my personality is not, it's not the greatest. Honestly, and I'm just saying this with, from the bottom of my heart, I'm just hoping I'm not coming off too strong. Like, making friends is, is not that hard. So if you're having a lot of difficulty making friends, like, it might be a personality thing. Just being honest. Like, it, I want a soulmate. I want growth, but I don't have the support. 
right? I want freedom, but I just don't have the willpower that it takes to get to me, give me to that freedom. I want success, but I, I'm, not, I'm not disciplined enough to get that success. And I want, that, I want my destiny, and I want to reach everything that God has for me, but I just I don't have the direction that I need to take. And that's the dilemma of complications. I have a desire, but, but I don't have, I don't have, I have complications and I have desires, but I have contradictions. And this is such a real thing. Ask me how real is it? Real enough that it hurts. Real enough that when you really sit and think about what I just said, it's not just some, some, some crazy illustration, some funny illustration. It's a legit thing in your life that what you want has a contradiction and a complication that never lets you get over the hump. That never lets you actually accomplish it. One of the Bible's most prolific authors felt this very, 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 very much. And I want you to feel what he felt. So I want to take you to Romans chapter 7. And I want to read you some verses. And we're going to read it from, I want to, I'm going to put it up on screen. And I'm going to read it from the message version. If you read any other version, you can read it from that. I'm not endorsing the message version or telling you that I agree with everything about it. But we're not going to break it down word by word. I just want to read you the whole passage. And the message does something that I like to do from time to time. And it's, it captures the feel and the essence. The writer of this version of the message just, he knew Hebrew and he took the Hebrew and he interpreted the feel of what's happening. So I was telling my wife to give you a perfect example on, on, on why I'm reading off of this version today, even though I'm not endorsing it or saying it's the best version by any chance. I was telling my wife uh, if she knew what peppers was. Because apparently back in the 50s, peppers stood for glasses. And so somebody says like, uh, I have bifocal peppers. They were saying that they have glasses. And she was like, what? And I was like, yes. I was asking her if she knew what bust the gut means. I looked all this stuff up. Some of you already laughed and you're like, yeah, I know what. Bust the gut is not some kind of like stomach problem. It's the old LOL. Like it's just that, that, that's not what it, trans, what it translated to. And so, so we could be reading something and see bust the gut and we don't really understand what they felt, what they meant with bust the gut. We would understand LOL. So the message version took bust the gut and put LOL in it. And so for, <laughs> yeah, so for, for, for word by word interpretation, it's not, it's not, it's not my go-to, but for a passage, it can capture the feel and you can read on your own um, version and you can get the same feel. I just want you to feel what Paul felt. Paul felt, Paul found himself in a situation where he had a desire and that desire had a complication and a contradiction and he could not get over it. One that hopefully you can relate to. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, he says, What I don't understand about myself, and I'm reading off of this version. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I do things that I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what's best for myself and then do it, then it becomes obvious that God's commands are necessary in my life. This guy is saying, I need some direction because what I, what I want to do, this is probably what your version says, what I want to do, I often don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. So I need God's commands in my life to give me some kind of guide, right? I need God to say, I need the law to say, like, thou shalt not lie. Thou, I, need, I need this direction in my life in order so that I can may, hopefully do better, Right? So he's making an argument, and I know a few weeks ago I was watching a pastor talk about the elements of grace, and, and I was, he was making a connection, and he was talking about how the law does have its value. It's not what people think, but it does have a value. And then in verse 17, he continues and he says, but I need something more. Now he's going to start talking about how none of us are going to be able to fulfill that law. And that's why Jesus had to come. He said, but I need something more. For I know that the law, I know the law, but I still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it, it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. Come on, somebody. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad. And then I do it anyways. My decisions, such as they are, they don't result in action. Verse 21. 
it happens so regularly that he's become predictable. He's saying, at this point, I already know what I'm going to do. No matter how many times I cry at the altar, no matter how many times I raise my hands, no matter how many times I promise that I'm never going to do it again, it, it's predictable now. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. And I truly delight in God's commands. But it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins me in that delight. We're going to talk a little bit about what he meant, because that sounds a little bipolar. He says, not all of me, it's just obvious that not all of me joins me in that delight. Part of me covertly rebels, and, and, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. Paul felt it. He felt the difficulties of wanting to do something good, of having the desire to grow spiritually, but having complications and contradictions in his way. He felt it. And Paul was so real that he didn't feel the need to minimize it to give us confidence. He spends all of Romans chapter 7, most of Romans chapter 7, just from a really negative tone. It's like, you're Paul, right? Like, this is... Paul writing this. Paul. 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 You're like, he felt it. But he was so real, he didn't feel the need to minimize it. Let me tell you something about the real ones. Let me tell you something about your pastor, because I've talked to him. The real, your pastor's a real one, and the real ones are the ones that can call it like it is, Period. The real people in your life are the ones that can tell you something even when you don't like it. And unfortunately, we live, I'm kind of I'm kind of getting sick, I'm kind of getting tired, and that's why I'm excited about being with a church like like Keystone that can be real enough to tell you about how difficult it is without needing to minimize it so that you can feel this fake confidence that you can do it. I heard your pastor, I heard it, I heard his whole sermon, and I heard him open up and tell you guys how he struggles with 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 praying. And he can read the Bible every single day, not miss one day. But when it comes to prayer, it's tough. And when I heard that, I was like, man, that's a real pastor. Because somebody else is going to minimize it to you. To, oh, praying is easy. Reading the Bible, fasting is easy. Minimizing it to give you some fake confidence that you can do it. And Christianity has gotten famous for doing that now. Our songs, our sermons, our series, our shirts are all about like, oh, your pro it don't matter. Your problems, don't, your failure doesn't matter. Your limitations, doesn't, you're going to be fine. God still loves you. Let's write a song about it. Let's just sing. It's all good. Let's just minimize it. I'm tired of, 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 us, of us in Christianity, in order to drink the medicine of what the Bible, what the Bible prescribes, we need to water it down to the point of inefficiency. It's not efficient anymore. The Christianity we're living is not. When, 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 when the world can look at us and not really know whether we're Christians or not, just by looking at us, something's wrong. Something's wrong. The title Christians came about, not to get sidetracked, but the title Christians came about because after Jesus died, there were some people that were acting so much like him that out of a joke, they said, this guy's a Christian. Right? These guys are these guys are Josh's. I'm like, why? Because they act so much like Josh. You're telling me that our title, our title got created because people long before us were such good imitators of Christ that they earned it. But we live in a world where you just can't tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian anymore. There's no boundaries, there's no, there's no real lifestyle there's no real differentiation and paul was real enough to say we don't got to minimize the difficulties of sin in our lives so that we can feel fakely empowered to tackle it we can call it like it is i can call it like it is and i can spend the better part of romans chapter 7 telling you how i paul am struggling and in verse 24 you would think okay now some kind of hope right We've read seven, we've read 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, Paul, give us something on 24 to hype us up. Give us something on 24 to make us feel better. I've tried everything and nothing helps. Okay, Paul. <laughs> I'm at the end of my rope. Oh, Paul, no. Is there no one who can do anything for me? 
I don't know, Paul. You tell me. You wrote half of the Bible. Hey, you don't know. You're the one that's asking. Isn't that the real question? Isn't it, Paul? Isn't it? You would know. You wrote out, if you don't know, and you're struggling with sin, and you can't get over the hump, Paul, how can we? He didn't feel the need in verse 24 to make it all good, and he still loves it. Let's write a song about it. Let's just, let's just switch to a psalm, because this is too much of a depressing chapter. No, he kept it there. He kept it there. He was real. And I want to speak to you about that today, because if I'm being honest, I found myself in that situation. And that's why I read you off the message. Like you can read it in any version and you're going to get the same thing. But I read it off the message because Paul was saying it in words that I've said before. I've, 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 I've stopped before and thought, man, I'm predictable. This is, this is a really rough message to bring as a guest. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I, I beg God to change it. It's like, not this one, God, please. He kept going, and I told my wife, I don't know if I want to do this one. She's like, no, God kept pushing on me. Because the reality of it all is that we've got things that we desire and things that we want on a spiritual level, but there are contradictions and complications that haven't let you go. Let me just ask you this one thing. Don't answer. Does any one of you, is there anybody in the room still begging for a chain to be broken that you've been begging for for the last two, three years? Because if in the last week you've made a prayer that you made five years ago, you know what I'm talking about. You know. Paul doesn't try to make it all better. Instead, the same author goes on to explain to us theologically what's going on, right? Because he knew you really can't fix something if you don't know how it works. So Paul is saying, let me teach, let me show you how this works theologically. And so he tried to explain to us this this, this theory, and let me get a little bit geeky with you today. He tried to explain to us this theory of the trichotomy of man, right? You might have heard it as the dichotomy, and that's also an acceptable, uh, uh, has base for it as well. But let me just explain this to you, just so you can help understand what Paul understood. What he was saying is that the human nature is composed of body, soul, and spirit. Right? And Paul explains this in Galatians. The body is the physical thing in you, right? It's the thing that connects us to this world. It's the flesh. It's the thing that you see. It's the, it's, that's the body. And then the soul is the essence of your being. This is what connects you to your willpower. This is your willpower, your emotions, your rationale. Your spirit is the spiritual thing in you. It's the thing that connects you to the spiritual realm. And this is where, where theories split, right? Because some will believe that the spirit that, is, that resides in you is either of the world or of God. And some believe that you're dead until you accept God and then you have a spirit. So until you accept God, you're only body and you're only uh, soul. Then you accept God in your body, soul, and spirit because he takes on you, right? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He seals you. Regardless of what you believe, the lesson is still the same. And that is that we are composed, Paul is explaining how we're composed of three. And all these three things are living inside of you. What? Yes, and and, and let's get weirder. In Galatians 5, he makes such a clear distinction between them. In verse 16. Let's go to Galatians 5, chapter verse 16. Look at what it says. Galatians 5, verse 16. Paul explains it and he breaks it down. You can see it all, everything that I just said in one verse. Right? So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So clearly, you is not the Spirit. And then gratify the desires of the flesh, then it's not the you. So we can see right there, three distinction between three different characters in one verse. So I say, walk by the Spirit, one character, and you, apparently a second thing, second kind of entity, person will not gratify the desires of the flesh third and then it takes it even further and it says in verse 17 for the flesh desires well now this this, like has like a mind what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want i don't know about you but i read this 
And I'm like, that's some weird stuff. And you're like, Pastor, don't say that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling you how I read the Bible. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't like it, I get it. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm not preaching next week. So <laughs> just, <laughs> just come again. All right, just come again. This is. They should. You should have put a note out there. Our, our, our chef is not cooking today. So that, if you don't like the food, you can try it again next week. So don't give a review off of this one. Okay, <laughs> wait till next week and give a review. This is just some Puerto Rican chef they brought. He says, he says, you have a flesh, you have a spirit, you have a soul, and the flesh and the spirit are do, I want contrary things, and that makes you in conflict because you don't know what to do with yourselves, and you don't end up doing whatever you want because the flesh tells you do this, and the, and the spirit tells you do this, and you're stuck in the middle. He then also tells us clearly what is it that the flesh desires, and what is it that the spirit desires? What is it that they produce? He goes and he lays out how the flesh and all of his works, and he lays it out. And we're not going to read it because of time, but you can see it in Galatians chapter 5, and I'll put it up on the screen for you. He lays it out. Boom. Here's the, what the flesh works. And then he tells you the spirit. Boom. Here's what the spirit desires. Here's what the spirit produces. And if you compare those two things, they're extremely different. And here's where it boils down to. Whichever you indulge gets empowered and the other depleted because right now it's looking some crazy personality bipolar issue all going on inside of us right the flesh wants one thing and that's me and the spirit wants one thing and that's in me and i want some. whatever you indulge will get in power and whatever you don't will get depleted let me give you like a, 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 a the best way that i can explain it the best illustration that i can give you right it's not like don't go look for it in like doctrinal books Maybe go look for it in youth books or something like that. Because this is like a really youth type of illustration, but it helps me understand it. Because I'm a visual person. It's like if your soul was a food truck supplier. Yes. And on the one side, you have the spirits buffet. Anybody still like buffets? Yep, that explains it. Like, <laughs> that's why things are dying. Like, it wasn't COVID. It was us. Like, we just... On the other hand, you have the flesh's buffet. You're the food truck. And you have the, 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 the flour and the sugar and the rice and the potatoes and the starch. And you have all that stuff. If you drive your food truck, which intentionally you would have to, to the spirit's buffet, the spirit will take that stuff and make some goodies for you to live off of. If you drive your food truck to the flesh's buffet, the flesh will take it and make some goodies for you to live off of. So if you take your willpower and your emotions and your time and you spend it in the spirit, you find yourself finding food and supplements and being able to eat off of it really good. And then you end up with joy in the buffet. And you end up with peace in the buffet. And with patience in the buffet. And somebody like cursed you at work. And you just have this spirit that like you just have peace with that person. And joy with that person. And self-control. And gentleness. And goodness. Because you've been spending so much time in the spirit's buffet. That's what the spirit's buffet offers. So you eat off of it. And you live off of it. But when you take your food truck supply and your time and your emotions to the flesh's buffet, it starts producing some, some, some junk food, let's call it. And now all you're living it off of is like Twinkies. And maybe for the South, moon pies. Like you're living off of like this, this junk food that is producing and that's what you need to eat. And so, Pastor, what are you talking about? Next time you feel tired, that's why you see some people that when they need a break, they need to go do drugs. Why? Because their rest is only supplied in the buffet of the flesh. And then some people are tired and they can easily go into the Word, read a psalm, and come out and feel, ah. And for those that are used to living off of Twinkies, they're like, you just got full with a broccoli? Right? Did you, just like, did you just seriously feel rested off of reading Psalms? Like, I read Psalms and I don't feel rested at all. I don't feel relaxed at all. And it's like, dude, because you're used to this type of food. As a matter of fact, not to get sidetracked, but I actually believe that this is a reason why a lot of us come to church. Because we get to eat off of the buffet of the pastor. Because he has enough. He should. <laughs> 
And so you eat off of his buffet. And if you come on Sundays and you come on Wednesdays, that's good enough to survive. It's good enough to live the Christian life that way and survive. But you know what you'll never do? Grow. You can't. You're eating twice a week. Can't possibly grow like that. So you'll survive and you won't die, but you won't grow. And that's the distinction. You, where, where are you taking your food truck supply? Because you're intensifying the desire, the appetite, the comfort, the intrigue. You're so used to it. You're intensifying it. Every time you provide it with your time, every time you provide it with your willpower, with your rationale, and this buffet could, becomes more and more appetizing to you. Because that's what you're used to eating. That's what you're used to living off of. And so who, which one are you empowered? They're both living inside of you and it fogs things up. It makes things weird. Because then you find yourself with a bunch of contradictions like we discussed, with a bunch of complications. It makes me think this whole thing of like two living inside of you, it makes me think of this uh, thing, famous thing called alter ego. Has anybody heard of alter ego? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, a few of you. Alter ego. The alter ego is a super, super popular thing. And apparently, the alter ego is when your mind adopts and creates this persona or character that has specific traits that you desire, but you might lack. And so at times, you borderline invoke this alter ego, this persona that you've created in your mind so that you can act like that persona and you can get the things that you need. You let it take over. It's like the character can be real or fake. This is a real thing. You can look it up. The character can be real or it can be fake. It can be imaginary or it can be spiritual. It, 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 it depends on how you take it. Artists do this a lot. Athletes do it more than anybody else. They create a trigger in their minds where they allow themselves to become somebody else that they feel like they need in the field. That they are usually not like that. But they need to be that savage to be able to play the game of football. Or they need to be that savage to be able to play the game of rugby or basketball or whatever. They need to be in order to do their thing, right? So you create this trigger in this persona, and then you, like, invoke it or you trigger it. You go into that mode. Very interesting stuff. And then you have abilities that you didn't have before. Let me give you some examples. Like, Beyonce, I know we're in church, but... Uh, Maybe you know who I'm talking about. Maybe not. Right? Safe? In a safe space? Those are reference every week. Okay, good. Beyonce has uh, an alter ego. She calls it Sasha Fierce. You can look interviews in this and stuff. Like, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And again, if you don't like this stuff, I don't preach next week. Uh, you can view it. It's, it's fascinating. She has Sasha Fierce. And she literally says that she grew up in a gospel home. So she is not comfortable with wearing provocative clothes. She's not comfortable because, I mean, you grow up all your life being told not to do that. She's not comfortable with singing certain lyrics. But she had to in order to become famous. So she created this alter ego personality, and she named it Sasha Fierce. And she will borderline invoke it. And then Sasha Fierce, she says in interviews, that would come and take over her so that she could dance in ways that she would never do. There's athletes that do it all the time, if that's the weird to you. Donald Glover, he created Childish Gambino. George Kittle, if you like football, he creates the Joker. And like legit, when he's on the field, this, the, the, the tight end for the 49ers, he laughs like the Joker intentionally because he's trying to trigger his mind into believing you're the Joker, right? Uh, uh, Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, like he, he used to be called the black, like he called himself the black mamba. And he said that before games, he would walk into a locker room and there'd be a cage with a black mamba in his mind, right? Not actually. Yeah, because then he, he would have died way before. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was. <laughs> too soon, too soon. Too soon, my bad, Copes. Uh, he would walk into a room and there'd be a cage with a black mamba in his mind. And he would open up the cage and he says, his words, not mine, look it up. The, the black mamba would roll up his arm and bite him, and he would become a black mamba with the mentality of a destroyer in the court. And then when he would get off the court, he wasn't like that. Which in his case, uh, but in, it, like that's what he said. They create this persona. We see it in comic books, right? Like Superman needs to become Clark Kent in order to be able to operate. 
This practice got super popularized by a mental coach. He created a book. Okay, you can look it up. He created a book called The Alter Ego. And it's the different identities in you that you need in order to succeed in life. He mentors CEOs, leadership, entrepreneurs, crazy. He says that the first time that this was ever recorded was by Cicero, the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor in 44 BC. Cicero writes a letter to his friend and he gives him advice. And in this letter, Cicero uses the word, invoke the other I or the most trusted friend. Because Cicero believed that two are stronger than one. So the things that you can't accomplish on your own, you need to trigger another you that lives inside this unlocked, untapped potential that could come out and could take over your body. So let's make a pause real quick. If you like grew up in a like a super like religious home, this is some freaky stuff to you. At least to me it is. It's like this sounds like demons to me. Like <laughs> Yeah, that's, how, that's what I'm interpreting. Like, if you grew up in a, in, a, in a home that wasn't as religious or, or didn't think about, like, all the spiritual stuff, like, if your parents didn't really make a big deal out of, like, I don't know, like, witch, witchcraft and stuff like that, then for you it's like, sure, it makes sense. But for everybody else it's like, this is weird. Well, where am I going with all of this? Let me, let me, let me take it a, le a little bit deeper. This practice is growing so much of creating alter egos to empower you that it is, it has gotten super intricate. Number one, here's a few things. Number one, you need to name the persona. In order for this to work, they recommend that you name it. So like there's an alter ego called Geronimo or whatever. And so you invoke Geronimo to, to it's like if I was preaching, I wanted to preach better and I just have Elias and I'm called Elias. And then when I preach, I'm Elias. Call me Elias or Reverendo. Like, like just call yourself some, some crazy thing. Number two, you assign clothes to it. So you have to get a piece of clothing that you associate with that persona and you have to put it on, right? That's why athletes might have like a certain sleeve or a certain shoe or this like article of clothing that you put on in order to remind your mind what you're doing, right? And so this is, this has been studied. They took about, you guys with me still? Yeah? Okay, good. They took about 100 people and then they put them in a room and they made a test of this. They took a screen and they put the, the, the word yellow, but it was colored green. You guys seen that? And then they put green, but it was colored blue. And they asked the, 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 the people to like write down the words of these colors in order. They put a sequence of like 10 or 20 and to write down the words in order that they came out. But because the brain is visual, the brain would pick up the actual color before it would read the word. And so that's what you had to write down. They put a, a, a couple people in a room. They asked them to write it down. They performed poorly. Then they brought a, a second type of people and to try out this theory called uh, enclosed cognition, they put them in a coat and they called it a painter's coat. And they asked them to do it then. Well, because the mind associated that they were painters were also focused on the color and did not succeed. They performed exactly like the people that had no coat. Then they brought a third group and they gave them the same coat but told them it was a scientist coat, which automatically created this weird thing in their mind that made them more detailed. So they are now thinking like they're a scientist in a way, the brain, and they perform three times better than everybody else. They call this enclosed cognition. It's when your brain associates a story with an article of clothing, and then you adopt that thinking that it's true. We did this as kids. Did, am I the only weirdo that bought some fast looking shoes and swore he was faster? You feel me? Am I the only guy, right? I think maybe Josh, maybe Josh will connect with me. Am I the only guy that bought the shoes with the pump? Whoa! I just saw three inches. Like, it's just, you swear. Like, man, we just, I just elevated more. Like, oh, my jump is off. I mean, just, like, we associate articles of clothing. You give a kid a cape. And watch what it does, right? You go watch Fast and Furious and get back in your car. <laughs> Jeez, it's like, it's not a good thing. Right? We associate it with that. And when we associate it with that, like our, our brains adopt that kind of persona. People did this, really famous people did this. Martin Luther did this. Martin Luther, Mar Martin Luther King Jr., he did not have to wear glasses. But every time he would write a speech, he would wear some un some glasses that were unprescribed, unmedicated glasses. And back in the day, it wasn't because of no blue light stuff. So he, 
he, he, would, he would put on these glasses and he would write his speeches only with the glasses. He thought it made him smart. He felt like he was smarter. Well, Winston Churchill did this. He had a wall of hats and he called it the wall of self. And depending on what type of attitude Winston Churchill felt like he needed in order to succeed during his time, he would go to his wall of hats and he would pick out a hat that some would make him feel more fierce and some would make him feel more friendly and some would make him feel smarter and he called it the wall of self. When he would put on that hat, his brain kind of like tricked him into believing that somehow he is now smarter or faster and it unlocks this potential. That's what this theory says. It takes it even deeper and in, in, in the book, it, he goes on to say that you kind of have to make a ritual with it, like a, like a pre-game routine, right? That you have to do where you invoke like, or invite, whatever you want to say, this persona, this alter ego to take over you. So now you're faster or you're stronger. And, 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 I, and again, to me, it has a weird feel to it. Like, I come from a, from a background where it feels like, man, that's demons, right? But it gets, it gets even tougher when you see that it aligns with how your brain scientifically and psychologically develops. And so if God created the brain... <laughs> It's like, is there merit to this? The brain is apparently more effective following a model. And when you can characterize, when you can create a character, your brain can adopt it easier, and then you can perform better. Because we're visual people. And like I said, we did it as kids. This idea of alter ego, this trusted friend within that will help you unlock this peak potential that's inside of you, capable of doing incredible things. That's what the alter ego says. So, so hold on, let's recap, because I just took you on a weird roller coaster. What the heck does this have to do with anything? Well, let, let, let me connect this, these dots to you, see if it makes as much sense to you as it does to me. The world scientifically believes that there is untapped potential inside of you in the form of, there's, there's untapped potential inside of you, and this potential is in the hands of a character that lives within you can do unimaginable things if you name this character and you invoke it. This is what the world believes. Your brain is designed to work with that. It's designed to understand that. So when you do it, you just, it actually works. This is what the world says. And why does it work? Because by doing it, you essentially tame the weak you, right? Because the weak you wouldn't do that. But this other you would. It would tackle that guy. It would sing those lyrics. It would dance that way, right? It would speak with that confidence, this other you. That's what the world thinks. And as I'm reading it, and they call that the alter ego, as weird as it seems, I actually think they got it almost right. Because it seems to me like they copied it from the Bible. And what the Bible reveals about ourselves, they just changed it in a way that would negate God's power. And like, Pastor, what are you talking about? Let me, let, let, let's, let's review what this world believes. Let's review it, but let's review it through what the Bible tells us. That there is this untapped potential inside of you. Check. I would say the Bible talks about that. That there is a potential that is in the hands of a character within. Check. It's just called the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not, it's not a fake character that you made up. And, and you could do the unimaginable things by invoking it. No, no, no. You can do the unimaginable things if you surrender to it because now you find yourself in a position where you can forgive somebody that you would have never forgiven. And you can love somebody that you would have never loved because you surrendered to it. It's a, that our brains were designed to work in a way that understands this. Yes, because God did our brain and he made our brain knowing that it would work better with the Holy Spirit if we just let him take over and we let and we surrender completely to him. And why does this work? Not because you tame the weak you, but because, Galatians chapter 5 verse 24, but because those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. The world got it almost right. They just needed to get God out of the equation. There is untapped potential inside of you. You can do things that you right now don't think are possible. You can accomplish things that you, and it is not just me hyping you up. This is me telling you that God created you with a purpose. And anybody that tells me that that's not true, I'm going to have a hard time with that. Because my God is an intentional God. And my creator would not, I never met an in, 
inventor that was successful that would build things just to build them. That would spend their time and their effort and their energy into something that was going to go to the trash. They built something with a purpose. And if that's how the world thinks, imagine our God. He created you with a purpose. And he prepared you for it. He placed a certain character in you. He placed a certain identity in you that he created and he named so that you could do the things that you were made to do. You don't understand why you're so OCD and why you're organized. And sometimes that gets you in trouble. But I'm telling you that God made you that way because he was going to use that for his glory. You don't understand why you're so innovative and imaginative and you're always daydreaming and you're always wondering. And people are like, man, just, just get your feet back on reality. You don't understand why you're like that. But I'm telling you that God made you with those qualities because he wanted you to build something for his kingdom. He built you with a potential that is inside of you. He gave you characteristics. Sometimes you're too bold for your own good. Sometimes you're too brave for your own good. But God made you that way for a reason. The other day, <laughs> the other day we were at our house. And we'd just been remodeling this house. It's a long story. I'm running out of time. Um, the other day we've been, <laughs> I was talking to Andrew, and Andrew said, man, one time I preached 50 minutes. And I was like, they're, gonna, they're never going to invite me to Keystone again because <laughs> I get sidetracked. But the other day I was in my house, and, and I heard what I thought was an owl. I was like, oh, I think there's an owl out there. I don't know if that, it, can there be an owl? You're just going to ask the question just in case, right? Can, maybe? Like, do owls live in North Carolina? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, just one, just making sure. Just making sure. Like, so I was like, man, I think it's an owl. Yeah, I didn't want some, I don't know, some scientist to be in the room and be like, this guy's dumb. Like, there's no owls in North Carolina. Like, just like I thought, I was like, babe, I think that's an owl. We heard it, right? And then all of a sudden my wife was like, huh? And she opens up the door a little bit. And she goes like, no, babe, I think it's a coyote. Can coyotes live in North Carolina? <laughs> okay, okay, just making sure. <laughs> She's like, what a dumb conversation these two were having. <laughs> she, goes like, she goes like, she goes like, no, I think it's a coyote. Then I start hearing it, and it starts sounding more like a coyote. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And she goes like, let's go out, get a flashlight. Get a flashlight? Close the door. I'm telling you, are you crazy? You're not going to go in out there with a flashlight searching for an owl. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> but that's my wife. She, 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 she's got this like weird, like a thunderstorm is coming and we get those warnings like, fong, fong. she runs outside with the camera. I'm like, get inside. What are you doing? She'd be the first to die in the movie. She'd be the first. <laughs> she's the one walking down the steps and you're like, no. And she's like, let's just go check. <laughs> what are you doing? She's got this weird, like, courage to her and this weird boldness to her. And it will get her in trouble. If it wasn't for me, she'd be dead from that coyote right now. She'd be dead, I tell you. She's got this weird courage and this weird boldness that would get her in trouble. But God designed her that way because no woman in her right mind would church plant with me during the circumstances. But her boldness says, let's go do it. She's the one, people. She's the one. You don't know much of my story, but I was set up in Hickory. We had a house. She was pregnant. I was en route to take over a church that I helped plant with my dad, a church that is averaging 900 plus people, and I was going to be the senior pastor. The transition was in place. I did not have to church plant. I was good. And I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm just telling you it made no sense. But God kept tugging on me and tugging on me, and it was her that one time I looked at, we went on a retreat, and I told her, you know why we're going on this retreat, right? She goes like, yeah. And I'm like, we're about to ask God if we're supposed to plant or not. She looked at me and she said, Pfft, that's not why we're going on this retreat. I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? She said, we're not going on this retreat to ask God if we're supposed to plant this church. We're going to ask God how we're supposed to plant this church. She already knew. And she had this boldness to her that is down to renovate a house because we didn't have enough money to buy a house in Charlotte. So we had to buy one that was unrenovated renovate a house, raise a child that started walking at eight months old and getting into all of the renovation stuff, live in a construction site, open up a church, no money. And it took that boldness that might, that might get her killed by a coyote. 
but God put it in her for something good. It's just in you, there's something too. It might just be untapped. It might just be untapped potential that is inside of you. And this is such a real thing. Ask me how real. This is such a real thing. Ask me how real. Real enough that it actually hurt. Just not you. It hurt him. Real enough that it took a sacrifice. And you're here asking, how do I do it? How do I tap into that potential? How do I, how do I unlock that master key to finally get over the desires of the flesh that I haven't, been get, I haven't been able to get over? How do I unlock that so that I can finally say yes to God, to the thing that I've been running from? How do I get that, Pastor? Because I've tried everything, and I know you've tried everything, and Paul tried everything. And that's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying in verse 24, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? And in verse 25, he says, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted. Not you, not me. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So I ask you the same thing that I asked you in the beginning. How? What do you want? I ask you the same thing that your pastor asked me. What do you want? What do you want to do spiritually? What is it? What chain is it that you've been trying to break? What addiction, what fault, what failure keeps pulling you down and dragging you down? Come on, be real with me. I know I'm, I, I know I'm screaming and I'm shouting and I'm running all across the altar. But it's not because I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm Pentecostal. I'm just Puerto Rican. Like, and I'm just telling you, I'm asking you, what is that one thing that you want to do and you have not been able to do? Because if you want to do it, The one that can untap that potential inside of you and empower you to defeat the flesh is trusting and shadowing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ every single day and crucifying those desires. So the ones that are like me that have failed so many times that they've become embarrassed to answer the question. To the ones that are like Paul that feel stuck and can't accomplish what their heart truly desires. I get it. And I know that it's tough. But what do you want? Because if you truly want him, what will set you apart isn't your success. No one can succeed without him. It's you trying again. It's you making sacrifices like he did. And when you fail, and you will, you remember that more than 2,000 years ago, he died so that you could try again under the coverage of grace. So I'm here asking you for one thing. From the bottom of my heart, try again. To the youth that's here and they've been struggling with pornography for the longest time, try again. To the husband that's been struggling to stay faithful, try again. I know you feel like it's predictable. To the, to the man that's been trying to budget but can't figure out his finances, get out of here and try again. Do what Paul did. Strive for that for which he reached me. He said, I carry on and I move on trying to reach that for what he reached me. He died because he saw that untapped potential in you and he knew that you would never get over the yoke by yourself. He knew that you were going to fail and feel like trash the next day. He knew, but he still died, not just for the sins that happened to you yesterday, but for the ones that are happening today and the ones that are going to happen next week. 
And he still did it. So if he knew that you were going to fail tomorrow, and he knew that you were going to drop the ball again, and he knew that you were going to fail over and over and over again, and he still moved on and died in that cross, who are you to sit and quit? Who are you to stop? Just because you failed yesterday, big whoop, so did I. So do all of us. But you got to get up and you got to try again. Because he died for that chance. He died for that tomorrow. He sacrificed so that you would never give up on the path of holiness. Not perfection. He knew perfection was impossible. He didn't call us to be perfect. He called us to be holy. Which is the one that gets up and tries again and again and again. You won't accomplish it with an alter ego. You'll accomplish it with an alter calling. And you need to re-surrender right now. Not accept Jesus Christ again. Accept what his sacrifice was for again. And again and again and again and again. Because you're only dead when you let yourself die. Until then... So my sermon to you today is simple. Walk not in the full confidence of what your abilities can do. Walk in the full anointing of what the Spirit has prepared you to do. Even when it makes no sense. I am supposedly uh, five weeks from planting a church. And check this little detail out. We still don't have a place. I don't know where I'm going to have my first service. I truly, legitimately, as I speak to you, don't know. I can't send marketing. I can't order signs that have a little arrow that says bathroom that way. Because I really don't know where the bathrooms are going to be. And I, and I go to bed at night and it stresses me because over a year ago, I asked God for this date. And he told me September. And now I'm standing here in August and I'm thinking, God, could you back it up a little bit? And God keeps telling me, no, September. So I stand in front of my launch team, 30, 40 people, all asking me, what are we going to do, Pastor? What are we going to do, Pastor? What are we going to do, Pastor? And I grab the microphone with my Puerto Rican self and I tell them, we're launching September. And I'm telling you guys, I'm launching September. That's where you don't have a place. Tomorrow, I'll pick up the phone and I'll try again. And I trust God that the breakthrough is right around the corner. How do I know I'm not on six? I know you've been trying for a long time, but how do I know I'm not on six? That's what do you mean on six? Didn't it take seven times to break down the walls of Jericho? How do I know that I'm not on the sixth phone call? How do you know you're not on the sixth attempt on breaking that addiction of that sin? The only way you know is by trying again and letting God do what only he can do. So I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and let me pray for you. I want you to react to the sermon with me. What is it that you want, church? What is that one thing that you desire? What is that one prayer request that you prayed today and you also prayed five years ago for? What is that one wall that does not seem to fall? What is that area that you find yourself just like Paul? Just like Paul. Hear his words, not mine, his words. What is that one place that you're just like, I don't understand myself. I decide one way and then I act another. I do things that I absolutely despise. So if I can't tr be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it. I can't be trusted. I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. And I can will it, but I can't do it. 
and I decide to do good. I've made this prayer that I'm making today before, Pastor. I've told myself that I was going to fight for my marriage. I told myself that I was going to fight that addiction. I told myself that I was going to do better in finances. I told myself that I would get out of that job. I told myself that I would forgive that person. And here I am making the same prayer because I never do it. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, and I don't really do it. And I decide not to do bad, and then I do it anyways. My decisions are not resulting in actions. I've made this prayer before. I am predictable. I'm fighting the same giants I was fighting a few years ago of anger and emotions and despair and and, and depression and anxiety. I'm still fighting those same demons. And I just can't get over it. Listen to me. I'm not here to minimize that giant. It's going to be just as hard as it was a year ago if not harder. I'm not here to give you some fake confidence and a pep talk. I'm here to tell you what the gospel tells us. And it is that, Pastor, you need to try again. Mom, you need to try again. Dad, you need to try again. Because there is untapped potential inside of you that if you surrender to the Spirit, He will unlock do things that you never thought were possible the unimaginable and he will glorify on it and one day not far from today I'll come back to Keystone and you will tell me how God did it not you it's impossible for you to have done it one day I'm going to come back to Keystone and I'm going to tell you how we found a place and it won't be because of my efforts it'll be because God saw that I wouldn't give up you may be on six. One more lap. Come on, man, one more lap. Try it again. Go at it again. Try it again.